Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for Fullcast's fireside chat. Today's topic is RevOps as a philosophy, and our guest is Abi Ingle. Um, why don't we take a couple of seconds here and have Abi introduce himself and tell him what tell us what you're doing at Qualtrics. Thank you, Tyler. And um, I'm Abi Ingle. I am the head of revenue operations. Uh, pre-sales and industry at uh, Quartrix. I've been here for just over a year, so joined an exciting time. The company's gone public, made three acquisitions. So RevOps has been hard at work over the year. Prior to that, I used to be the head of digital and product and various different functions at AT&T. And prior to that, I was a CMO at a couple of Silicon Valley companies. Started off my career at a McKinsey and Company and super excited to be here and share some thoughts with you. Wonderful. I know we've got now 28 minutes to compact a really big topic. And you know, you and I were talking a little bit before this call and there's a lot to cover. So I do wanna jump in and, and get started. Uh, my favorite way to start these things is to give you the broadest question possible. <laughs> and then we'll figure out where it goes from there, right? So um, we're talking about RevOps as a philosophy. So what does RevOps as a philosophy mean to you? And maybe what are some of the components uh, as a part of that philosophy? Okay. Let's just break those up, right? Because I think a lot of people struggle with is revenue operations possible at a company when you're not re when you're not organized in that format. Okay. And what I'm going to posit today is revenue operations is a philosophy, it's a mindset as well as an organization. And you can actually execute one without being necessarily organized that way. So in the most formal way. Revenue operations can be a formal organization which encompasses the previously separate domains of sales operations, marketing operations, and CS operations housed under one roof. Okay, that's the formal definition of revenue operations per se. Or it can be a philosophy that takes a look at the operations involved with everything to do with revenue and ensures that those three organizations act in harmony around those key revenue objectives. And it's not just revenue objectives, these are all operational metrics I've talked about. There are also experience metrics around that, right? And I come from an experience management company, so it'd be remiss for me not to mention that because at the end of the day, understanding how your customers are experiencing your company holistically is critical. Experience drives buying, renewal, and upsell opportunities. And capturing that signal and turning that data into insights is critical to keeping your customers loyal Similarly, understanding how to optimize the experience of your employees, and in this situation, all the employees are interacting with customers, is going to be important because their well-being and engagement is going to drive your customer experience. So philosophically, we also say um, that our mission is to make sure that you design and improve the customer and sales and revenue team experience to accelerate revenue, right? Yeah, that then I get into the operational metrics that you talked yeah. about. Right. So how do you do that? Um, kind of think about it as people, data and process. And one thing I'll just start off by saying is decision making has to be driven by data and they have to be single sources of truth. OK, if you don't have uh, decision making culture and philosophy driven by let's look at the data and you don't have people looking at the same sets of data which means that your systems and your process need to be interconnected, then it's very hard to get to an objective cross-revenue decision. So making sure your people are aligned around a single view of the business with shared revenue targets, you wanna make sure their goals are aligned. Two, data, connecting the business and activity data across the different organizational uh, technology and operation silos. And then from a processes, you gotta have integrated cadences, right? Where people come together to look at the customer holistically. What's a healthy customer, for example? Okay, what are the metrics? What role does sales have in that? What role does CS have in that? Getting some agreement around that and how we measure it. So that's would be my overall perspective on the two questions that you asked me. Now, how do they play out in different organizations? So I actually like to talk about um, this, like the inflection point of really, you know, you're starting to grow and RevOps is really becoming a, a thing. And you now are 
a lot of people understand the operational side of things, right? What we just mm-hmm. went through, like the data and mm-hmm. uh, making data-driven decisions, putting together processes, but layering in this experience piece as an organization that's growing, how do you begin to start to think about like doing that? Where, you know, where do you start? Right. So if you think about your customer journey, that's the best way to think about it. Customer journey or a buyer journey, whatever you want to call it, right? I call it a buyer journey because some of them are not your customers yet. And it starts in the marketing function in terms of how you're interacting with somebody, right? What, what are the ways in which you're reaching out? Uh, when then you that they turn into a into a lead, a sales qualified lead, you then actually talk to them. When they turn into a customer, then you actually have CS work with them, right? So if you think about that customer journey, mm-hmm. there are oftentimes multiple people touching that person. It could be a marketing communications, it could be an SDR, it could be an AE, right? An account executive, it could be a CS person, it could be an implementation person. How do you make sure that you understand the holistic journey that your customer or buyer goes through that process? Super important for you to gauge that. We obviously use that using using uh, Quadrix's experience management software, but making sure you understand that journey and optimize it so you understand how to pivot based on what a customer is experiencing. The second one is making sure that the employees who are touching that customer have what they need. Like very simply, what are you surveying your sales team to figure out what prevents them from being effective and serving your customer effectively? If they can't get the quote to your customer, we, we, I'll give you a specific example. We got some feedback from our customers that love the way your sales team engaged with us, okay? so excited with the technology demos. When it came down to getting a quote, it seemed to take a lot of time. When we went back and looked at the employee side and the first three issues that we saw, it was coding, coding, coding. <laughs> Why? Because our systems weren't interconnected, our, the different departments that touched that were not doing that. So we got signal from customers, but we had to go and get signal from employees. When we actually resolved that, that basically boosted our employee productivity, their satisfaction, but also helped customers significantly. That's a very specific example of that area. Yeah. On the CS side, we look at you know, different metrics such as, um, does our CS team have the tools that they need to service their customers? Do they have the advanced reports that give them? What is a healthy customer? What drives that? What kind of predictive data can you give them? So these are the kind of things that we look at that are very specific examples, hopefully, that give you a sense of what we look at. Does it change? I mean, you, you've been in companies that are a little bit larger than <laughs> some of these startups. And uh, does it change when you get up to like the scale that you've been at with like Qualtrics and things like that? Do you look at different things? A hundred percent, right? You know, it's not just you look at different things, you start getting more automation in your processes. And that's yeah. one of the things for a revenue operations team to look at. You know, at Qualtrics, we pride ourselves, one of our values is being scrappy. Right, And I think of a scrappy as a way to take action quickly and move on something. It's a bias towards action, right? Yeah. Yeah. But after you scrappy it's something, okay, if you realize it's working, think of it as almost like an MVP, like a minimum viable project to get into market. At some point, if you're doing that a hundred times over and your team goes from like five people using a scrappy process to 200 people, 300 people, that process starts to really actually turn from scrappy into kind of crappy. You do not want to get that. So you're going from scrappy to scale, yeah. never from scrappy to crappy, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I hope we can quote that later. It's going to be the, the, the marquee. Uh, so let's talk about some examples here of how this philosophy comes into play when maybe we have some unexpected uh, changes in the market. So you know, I think real world examples are right. So I'll take a real world example of you know, something we're all frankly experiencing. And I just start saying that uh, I hope everybody is keeping ha- uh, healthy and you're taking care of yourself and your families, even as you do your jobs, because it's a really important time for us to kind of watch out for each other. There are a lot of people who are struggling right now with the pandemic. Okay. So as you recall, uh, you know, last year we had rolling series of disruptions to companies and to uh, consumers caused by how the pandemic progressed, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the turning points was as a mandate came down, uh, uh, requiring companies to be compliant with that particular, with with the with the with the vaccine uh, testing status and uh, testing that was required, right? Either you show your status that you're vaccinated 
or before you come in your test. How do you keep on top of that? There was like a twenty thousand dollar fine uh, being imposed by the by the by by the government on companies about a certain size if you're not compliant. That's a pretty big hit if you try to add it up, right? And there were all kinds of different fines and things of that nature. So Quartrix is an experience management as a as a platform. We very quickly pivoted and we realized that our industry team got signal that the government was going in this direction. It was going to come for government first. So they came, it came to us as the industry specific signal because we're constantly keeping on top of what our customers are looking for, right? That's we use our own software for that. And we quickly jumped in our platforms flexible and we created a solution that would allow companies to both ensure the safety and well-being of their employees and insurance compliance, which means they'll be compliant, they would save money and they would make that happen. Now, that was not something that was planned. It's not in the budget. It's not in the campaign flow. It's not in the sales training. It's not in the CS talk track. What the heck do you do? Yeah. And the company just totally turned on a dime. We changed our messaging. We changed our targeting, right? So we targeted the right customers. For example, there wasn't a mandate on this in uh, overseas companies, but there was in the United States. There was in the dark country. So very focused, change the campaigns, right? Change the messaging, change the training for only those employees in those areas from a sales perspective, right? and have the ability to be able to coordinate them and then actually implement it. How do you implement a new solution that came out? You don't have the partners, you have to change your implementation teams, you have to train your partners. If we had not done that in a holistic manner, we would have had marketing changing tack, targeting the right customers, salespeople going into the tone deaf uh, earlier track, right? That wouldn't make sense. Um, and then implementation resources not lined up to address the fact that we have a new solution market that had to be done in a very interconnected manner. We need to have the data to say, if you're gonna pivot away from an existing planned campaign, is the juice worth the squeeze, right? Yeah. Why should we do that? And if we had not applied that RevOps philosophy, the allowed us to pivot very quickly and address the option and meet customers where they are, which is super important. So without going into any details, let me just tell you, it was a very, very successful pivot. It was controversial when we made it, it's controversial when we can certain planned activities, but it was executed incredibly well because our teams had this philosophy of responding to customers and working with each other and being interconnected towards ensuring that end-to-end -end journey. This might be a, this is going to be a dumb question. The uh, how do you how do you how do you implement something like this? Like this philosophy, right? Like I love this idea that you know you you can if you've implemented this in, it's kind of almost part of the culture, right? Like philosophy and culture can kind of be one and the 100%. same, but like, how do you begin to start to change your organization to think about that? Like, how do you go about and implement? I know it comes back to the first principles that I started off. That's why I talked about philosophy, talked about operations, yeah. but added in experience. If you commit yourself, okay, to constantly designing and improving. It's not a once and done situation. Uh, to optimize the experience that your customers and your sales people or your revenue team more broadly, right? All the people who are touching the customer have. You're going to hear about these issues. You're gonna hear from employees on these particular topics. And once they feel aligned towards the optimizing the buyer journey, that's something it's a, it, that to me is a cultural moment, right? If you say that we are obsessed about our customers, okay, um, it becomes it, it becomes a it becomes a way of doing business. So if your customers are under the gun in compliance, you are getting signal about that. Shouldn't you do something about it? Yeah. Right. Uh, it, so you have to kind of drive that. And similarly, remember, if customers are going through this, your employees are also experiencing this. What are you doing to make sure employees feel safe about it? So that is an interconnected element that builds upon each other. And, but you can't start when you have the crisis. It's got to be a way of operating ahead of time and a set of compacts between the teams that when something of this sort happens, we hold hands, we make a decision. And that's why the decision can't be just done emotion. It has to be done based on data. For that, you need to have the right data sets underneath. Yeah, I, <laughs> we, I, I, I love this theme that I've been, uh sticking on with all these fireside chats which is talking a little bit about uh feedback loops because i i want to i want to see if you can just touch on maybe some of the feedback loops you've set up to reinforce this uh particularly this this like 
uh, philosophy of going this going after the buyer's journey and and um, making the customer experience as, as best as it can be. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, we live our own software, right? To some extent. So you, and without trying to turn into a shill for this, you're asking me a question about feedback tools. That's what Quartrix is all about, right? Fundamentally, <laughs> we actually have an employee engagement product line, right? Which is very widely adopted, okay? Yeah. And we use that for our own employees, right? Yeah. So on a quarterly basis, we are gauging the engagement, the manager effectiveness, um, their well-being around different elements. We have a lot of science behind this. We have a philosophy called EX25, which is a scientifically based approach of what are the four or five things that employees will look for, right? That's with employees. We have another product which actually helps us measure customer NPS, okay? We have products that do, for, for example, free text analysis. We have products that do conversational an analytics when customers call in. So we're constantly getting signal on what's coming in. And then we have an operating cadence where uh, every morning the, the, the executive team of the company gets together and say, what are we hearing? What's happening? And we talk about that. And then we have operating cadences across uh, sales and product, right? The specialists in the products and the product teams are talking on a, on a weekly basis. So you get signal, you act on signal. You say, oh, I need data. Pull in the operations people. What is the, what is the size of the opportunity that we're seeing out here? So that is a operating rhythm that we have, which is both using our instrumentation to capture signal, get the insights from the signal, but most importantly, take action on the signal. That's it. That's what I'm, that, see, I feel like we always are like getting signals, right? Everyone's always a, like gathering data and doing all that, but you never take the time to actually turn that around and take action on it. And I think what, what was in key there is that it, you had said it, you called it operating cadence or operating rhythm, but it's, it's making that part of the daily or the weekly thing that you're going to review these signals and then figure out what to do with them. And um, I think a lot of people a lot of companies may miss that part. They're like, well, we're collecting this. We have an NPS score. We've got all this information coming in, but um, we may not but for be us, those things are it. like, you know, those are big company bets. And we actually have a scorecard yeah. review on a quarterly basis. We look at these things. It, does, it can be formal. It can be informal. But you have to have a way that if you're going to measure something, you got to talk about it and say, what are you going to do about it? Right? Yeah. Don't just measure for the sake of measurement. That just makes no value. And oh, by the way, if you want to get something done, you got to measure it. Yeah. Right? Both ways. So that's um, how about how, how can this philosophy maybe lend itself to fostering, let's say, like some adaptability and resilience um, in an organization? I'll give you an example of adaptability. So I'm not going to repeat that, but let's talk about resilience, right? I think one of the things that uh, employees suffer from within a company is if your goals are not aligned, right? If you don't have the same similar objectives, then let's say, Tyler, you and I are talking, I could have an objective that pushed me in this direction and yours is pushing in that direction. We're pulling upon each other. Unless we have a common unifying objective, let's say, hey, what is your customer experiencing in their buyer journey? So you might be trying to maximize a metric. I might be trying to maximize a metric, but we are really at odds with each other. That actually helps align us, right? You can always have a discussion on a common goal. So you got to have your own metrics for each department, but also a common overarching goal. That's one. The second thing from a resilience perspective is, let's just take that example I talked about earlier. Imagine that only right, the sales operations team or the marketing operations team had the, had the objective of pivoting to that particular area. Imagine how hard it would be for a marketing person to come in and say, hey, sales, we're changing your entire training, your entire you know, script right now, and we are pivoting you to focus from this part onto this new platform and product. It would be almost impossible. The amount of stress it would cause for that person who was tasked with it would be terrible. Um, and, and this allows you to have the resilience because it allows you to know that you're part of a community of people that you can work with at multiple levels of the company that allow you to implement a change that's happened. The third one I would say is mobility and the ability to actually rotate through different departments and broaden your skill set. Because in the middle of all of this, you have to think about your employees' uh, learning, their development, their career pathing, right? Um, and the last thing is when you actually rotate through different departments, you develop empathy. 
if I've walked a mile in your shoes, I'm a lot more likely to sympathize and empathize with what you're experiencing of saying, oh, that person in CS ops, they are the worst. They never yeah. understand what we're trying to do in marketing or in, in sales, right? Yeah, so. that I, <laughs> this is like related, but unrelated. I was just taught, I was skiing this weekend and we were um, on the lift and we were talking about how everybody should spend time de-icing a lift because everyone's pissed off right now because we had so much snow in the Northwest that all these lifts are closed and everyone's like, why aren't they open? And it's like, you got to just spend the time digging out a lift and then you'll understand you'll have that empathy for what these people are going through to get things running and i think yeah that's huge so how do you how, how would you implement something like that do you just like rotate employees around like every year or the is it like opportunities that come up is it a forced rotation like how would you go about implementing some kind of program to uh, build this mobility aspect that's a complex question that does vary from company to company. There's three ways I kind of think about doing it. One is to model that behavior for people and say, hey, this is a very acceptable way. It's part of the discussions you have with people, right? A lot of people look at, you know, moving up in the organization in their yeah. particular function, telling them that, hey, you're more valuable at this level if you kind of done this level in two different departments is one way to do it actually choosing people and taking a risk on people who actually done that, right? So living it, first saying it, then two, living it, right? And then thirdly, having a system which says, hey, before somebody in CS hires somebody externally, would you make sure that you give a shot to the people who are intern in other departments who might want to do that? Give them a shot, right? Yeah. So Tyler might not have done CS, but if I know Tyler's a kick-ass marketing person at the front end, maybe you should give Tyler a chance. He's a known entity, he knows the company. <laughs> Right. So those three things, I think, come together to play and how that works out. That's that's great. Um, so we got a little bit of time left and kind of my favorite question, which is one of the last questions we have on this this list here is just uh, when we start to think about lar like large scale changes to our go to market. So we're now thinking about this go to market. You know, we're going through go to market planning. We're thinking about maybe putting the, the the pedal down to the floor and really pushing, or maybe changing how we're thinking about allocating sales resources. How does and this is how does all this philosophy that we've talked about up till this point kind of play into facilitating like these large scale go to market changes? You know, one of the questions that Tyler, I think you and Ashley had mentioned to me was you wanted to talk about one of the common things that companies face. Like, let's take a specific example. I think that always brings things to life as opposed to talking generally. Yeah. Is a, how do you decide between a regional go-to-market, a product go-to-market or an industry growth market? Or let's say that you're in a regional market and you're trying to verticalize your sales team, what happens? So this is a, this is a very common question. Okay, this is not an uncommon question. It does really require you to marshal and actually have a framework for thinking about this in a very systemic manner across the areas. For example, if you're going to change from a purely regional different territory and quota assignment to a vertically driven assignment, the first question is how many verticals are you going to do? There's going to be a trade-off out there between efficiency versus what I'll call effectiveness. Assume that if somebody has five, let's say financial services account, they're going to be better at talking to financial services, no question at all. But, you know, if those things are scattered over, over, a, over a, a, a big geography, maybe they can't develop the same relationship they could if they were located, located a little bit close enough. Some of this is becoming a little moot in a virtual environment, but those are important considerations. The other thing is, if in the process of moving from a regional to a concentrated vertical portfolio, I take my uh, account manager, okay? I love Tyler. He is the best account manager I've ever had. You just took him away from me. What the heck, right? You got a balance of disruption versus, you know, the ability for Tyler to have similar accounts so he can actually develop that. How do you weigh that off? Those are all data-driven discussions that you need to have. And part of that is data-driven from the perspective of saying, how much revenue am I disrupting, okay? Now, if you're a startup, and you've got like really small revenue, it's easier to do. If you're a billion dollar company and you're gonna be disrupting accounts worth $250 million, you bet this is gonna be a discussion with your entire executive team um, and maybe even a board of directors before you shift your people into that area. So you need to be very thoughtful about that particular trade-off. Marketing needs to have a perspective because what's the point of putting Tyler in this concentrated revenue? Uh, let's say you made the investment, you put him into all financial accounts, 
Do marketing and your industry teams provide them the content, the expertise, the top track, the specific value that they can provide? They don't have it, then why would you take on that disruption? Why would you? So those are very specific things that happen. Then let's say you sold them the dream, you had the right message, you talked about the business, but then your CS team couldn't actually deliver the value that you committed to them. How does that help anybody? That's why these type of resources changes. You have to have a very data-driven approach. You weigh off the pros and the cons, and you make sure that holistically you are ready to pivot. If you're not holistically ready to pivot, ask yourself, is it worthwhile for me to take on that disruption if marketing doesn't have new content, if CS can't actually uh, fulfill the promise of what we, what your salesperson just promised them, why would you do that? Okay. Um, and, and over time, as you get deeper into these vertically specific areas, you need to have a way to give product signal. Hey, we have learned that on our general purpose platform, if we build these two extensions, we're going to provide extraordinary value to our healthcare clients. We are actually doing something in healthcare. That's why I bring it up, right? We, we recently bought a company that is going to give us the ability to do um, uh, surveys that are very are compliant with what are called the healthcare CAPS requirements. Now, that's a survey with a specific methodology that's a regulated survey running on a general purpose platform. That's a very powerful pivot for us into healthcare. Is that worth pivoting people for? You bet, because you will provide specific <laughs> value to customers, right? Yeah. Specific value to customers. Is that helpful? Yeah, I think it is, you know, and, and really what's important here is that it, 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 again, goes all the way back to the beginning where we're talking about these inputs that we're, we're getting, right? So we're, we're getting feedback in different places throughout the buyer's journey and understanding operating cadence, reviewing that, and coming out of that might be this decision that in your, in your example, healthcare, there's this opportunity we can go buy this company or we've already purchased the company and we now need to think about aligning not just regionally but switching that to a, a vertical approach because here are all these inputs here's all the data that supports doing this and why and let's go do that exactly <clears throat> um so i think you know we're we're about up on time and i am out of questions, which is actually rare. Uh, the you've you've done such a wonderful job of of explaining everything. Um, I really appreciate it. I actually I, we should probably check the chat see if there's anything. We can I take don't one see. Question. We can take one last question if anybody has it. Yeah, if there's any questions from the group, and um, then we can do one question there. And Ashley has just chatted there, so we'll see. We'll give uh, 30, 30 seconds or so. Dun, dun, dun. Um, well, I don't see any questions coming in. So is it, I think, you know, do you have any departing thoughts um, or any kind of big overarching thing that you'd like to uh, give us a closing remark? Um, I just say, remember, RevOps doesn't need to be an organization for you to act in that manner that takes care of customers end to end, follows their buying journey, and also um, thinking about your employees and empowering them. Uh, ask yourself, how are you getting that signal from your customers, from your employees? Are you giving them what they need for your customers to be successful? And then do you have the operating cadences? And lastly, I just say, stay safe. Um, it's a new year, happy new year to all of you. And I hope you have amazing success this year um, um, as you as you go forward with this new RevOps philosophy. Thank you. Thank you, Abi. I appreciate you taking the time out of your extremely busy schedule. We all know this is planning season for everyone. So really appreciate it. And uh, until next time. Cheers. See ya.